Hi everybody, I'm Kenneth Bock, and we're here in Barcelona at the Congresso del Perdón. And with me, I have Anthony Paul Muyang, or more <laughs> affectionately known as Muji. Yeah. And uh, this this Congress is really, of course, it's it's the Congress of Forgiveness. And here we have um, teachers from A Course in Miracles and teachers from the Advaita uh, Vedanta tradition, such as Muji himself. And first of all, Muji, welcome. Thank, and thank you, you for thank being you. with us. Thank you. Good. So <clears throat> I'd, maybe I'd just like to start with this topic of these two fields coming together, which the way I see it is non-duality and forgiveness. Mm. And forgiveness is very much uh, an integral practice um, of the course, what we call the course, is the short for A Course in Miracles. And it, I think it's going to be a very valuable experience, especially for, for course students, to hear from an advisor teacher like yourself. So maybe let's just start with forgiveness. What does forgiveness mean to you? What does it represent in the practice of Advaita? Well, I was open to get my question in and ask you what it means for ah, you, the forgiveness, yes. because sure. when I first heard you know, the expression, you know, it, it obviously was indicating a broader um, meaning than most people would on the surface feel it. Forgiveness is, you know, asking for forgiveness for a wrong done or something like that. And normally it is from person to person or from sometimes a nation also asks forgiveness for another nation or something for acts done in a previous time or even at the current time or something. Mm. But when I heard it in the context that it was expressed, yeah. it felt I wanted to hear from you what is this term because you seem to put it it almost had a an, a kind of epic quality to it. So <laughs> I, I, I think I should be I should ask a question in sure. your in your yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, course. What does what does it mean? Uh, forgiveness. Yeah. Mm. I think you're absolutely right in saying that most people think that forgiveness is this um, almost like I am better than you because you did something wrong and I forgive you because I'm morally superior than you and that's maybe mm. for the most part of the world, how they, they view forgiveness. And that's certainly been something that has been ingrained with a lot of religion. Mm. I'm, I don't maybe even a bit of a limitation for me. Okay. That, because I think a lot of people in the, the Christian domain as, that I'm familiar with growing up, so sometimes that could, could forgiveness can be very challenging mm. for them. Mm. If it's really authentic, I'm not talking about politically correct forgiveness. Yeah. But a forgiveness which is to say, look, you know, you you kill my son mm. and you took away the light from our life. Mm. But I'm choosing from my heart to forgive you for this action. You know? So it can be also very challenging for people yeah. to, to to forgive, you know, like this. Yeah. Mm. Of course, there's the other thing that you mentioned as well. That can be there too. But I didn't want to leave out that for many people even so. Forgiveness, you know, is kind of like it's it's a light because it sometimes shows you where you're still, you know, you know, clinging to a deep pain and won't let go of this because you feel you have a right to be angry, you have a right to be sad, you have a right to be to be unforgiving or something. Mm -hmm. So yeah, on that level, no? Yeah. Yeah. But uh Yeah, of course I paint the, the extreme okay. of that spectrum. Mm -hmm. And so I guess what the course would call true forgiveness, and the course has two separate definitions of forgiveness. One is forgiveness to destroy, which is the forgiv forgiveness in the eyes of the ego, how the ego would want to perceive forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And the other is true forgiveness, or what the Holy Spirit, the path of the Holy Spirit, the path of spirit, as we say. And how what this true forgiveness is, is really to see innocence. And to deeply realize that there is no separation between individuals. And once you have that paradigm, you see that it's the left hand doing something to the right hand. Yeah. And something that, that interaction, you know, maybe like you said, yeah. someone has killed my son. When you deeply see that 
unity of all beings, then you realize that that interaction must have occurred because you want it to be separate from this individual. Mm. And true forgiveness is seeing this construct that you've made and dropping it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So, first of all, what do, you, what do you think of this definition of true forgiveness? Well, actually, I, I, I heard this now, mm. that from that place where you say, you know, in the higher consciousness, mm-hmm. where it is seen that uh, that we are one, yeah. uh, maybe we vary in expression, but in essence we are one, mm-hmm. one self. Mm-hmm. So therefore, as Papaji would say, if the hand puts food in the mouth, should the mouth say thank you to the hand? Mm-hmm. You see? No, it's one thing. So when life is seen with that unicity of being perspective, no? then automatically, automatically, we don't have to even say, I forgive you for doing this in a sense. It, it, is, it is immediately understood, spontaneously understood that it is just, there isn't really an individual doing something to another individual per se. Mm-hmm. Like that, no? that life becomes somehow like the theater room of consciousness. And something is playing out these roles and so on. And that there isn't really a person doing something to another person in the deepest and purest insight. Mm -hmm. Although we cannot totally dismiss this, depending on how authentic the position we're looking from is. Because if you, inside your heart, really see that there's a unity of being, that we are really one, Mm -hmm. you really are that then you could not survive as you and me survive as me. You understand? If there's really a unity, then where would I see you with any depth of meaning? Mm-hmm. You see, there cannot be you and me when, when we are one. We can say, at the superficial level of universal language interaction. We can say, yes, you did this and that, but that will be sitting inside a larger consciousness in which is already established that there's no reality to you and me as independent autonomous entities or something like that. Right. So the paradigm itself changes, the way of seeing changes. The way of seeing has changed then. Uh, the language would may continue because mm-hmm. we have to interact and we are still in these bodies and there is still a duality there, mm-hmm. hmm? a functional duality, mm-hmm. but it is not. Um, it causes no injury, because we see that the duality itself is a play and expression of unicity. Of you understand, it is of unity. Yes, yes, it's like the unity inside the diversity, as you could say, like that. Wow. Hmm? Otherwise, we're going to have a lot of hypocrisy. You're going to be a lot of people saying, no, we are one, there's no two, there's no... but still, you know, yeah, but well, you owe me this money, I want my money back, you know, and behind right. the curtains or something, because they haven't, they haven't really assimilated that meaning deep inside their being. They may only be saying that because at a conceptual level, at an intellectual level, they may say, I agree with that, I see that there's, there's, there's only the truth. Mm-hmm. But at the expressed, passionate level of living, they're still carrying the sense of individuality very strongly. So would you say this is almost like being gentle with the other participants in the dream, in still using that. No, no, because if you're being gentle, there's still something false about it, because it's still feeling that, hmm, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I gathered your meaning exactly. So maybe i give you a bit more space to say that with you. What I understood from you hmm. is that we, pre- assuming, I feel like I'm going to mind space here, but I'll just it's say fine. what I'm saying. I feel like what you're saying is, if a being has truly realized this concept of unity, he, still operating in the world, has to express himself with dualistic language. As is necessary. Yes. Because there wouldn't be, it's, it's like your, your life is not, is not coming from your mind. Mm-hmm. 
it is like without you need absolutely no preparation at all in life. Your life becomes a spontaneous existence. Right. So therefore, if I was meeting someone who I've not met before, I wouldn't have to research anything about them. So when I meet them, something automatically meets at the appropriate level. Because the human uh, instrument, when consciousness manifests or plays as humanity and believes strongly in its human identity, mm. it's as though it, it appears to separate into this, this entity with autonomy who have a feeling like, I decide where I'm going in life. This mm -hmm. is my life. This is my private life and whatever. Mm -hmm. So that changes. Right. So that interaction would be spontaneous. Yes. It would just flow. All interactions are, ch are spontaneous. Everything is spontaneous. When the ego, the personal, the person is not there. Hmm. Truth is sublimely simple. But the one pursuing truth is very complex. <laughs> Why? Because the whole, uh, the whole standpoint of a person is that I decide, I make decisions independent of the totality. Mm. And that is a massive illusion and delusion also. But why? Because consciousness plays on many different levels. One, it can play as intense identity with the body-mind and believe itself to be, I am the body-mind for a while. Mm -hmm. Everything is for a while. Mm -hmm. Because if consciousness plays as an individual, it will go for a while until that state becomes unbearable. Mm -hmm. Then it is mm, propelled, compelled into change mm -hmm. to go to a more subtle level in order to bear the weight of existence. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's, a, there's a parallel in The Course of Miracles mm -hmm. where it says that, um, well, this is a metaphor. Obviously, I mean, cash. I'll stop using obviously. Um, as the course describes it, it's a it's a tiny mad idea that appeared in the mind of Christ. That imagined to itself, what would it be like for me to go off and play on my own? And that's the the genesis of the ego, to think that it can have a separate existence from the mind of God. And like yeah. as just as you said there comes a point where I think in, again in the course it says uh, tolerance for pain may be high but it is not without limit. At some point at every, in every being's existence there is a point where it is the end of that cycle. There are other ways that. into change and transformation mm -hmm. but that is one of them um, when your life becomes unbearable at the level that you're living conceptually, because that's where unbearableness really is. I mean, there's physical pain, but we're talking very often about the kind of psychological pain, emotional pain, yeah. the pain arising out of egoic projections and thought. Mm -hmm. This is what I say, all beings are compelled into change. They're compelled to evolve. Um, in consciousness. And I guess I want to bring it here to relationships mm. because the course is, you know, the truths that are expressed in the course are, are universal truths mm. as expressed in Buddhism and Advaita and many of the other great wisdom traditions. But I would say that the course really excels in the, the arena of relationships, hence forgiveness. Uh, do you want to just maybe comment on, on this practice, and do you think it's relationships necessarily function in duality, expressions of duality, and they are part of the what I'd call the expression of dynamic consciousness, which I mean a consciousness which manifests as multiplicity, as mind and change and and variation and all of this. Then it's part of the dynamic field of of life. Relationships we are we are compelled into relationships. But before any relationship can begin, you must start with the sense of I. That is the first shaped concept you must have. The sense of I must be there before even the concept of you. 
you derive its meaning from I in relation to I. Mm-hmm. It's not a word that can live by itself. The sense I must be the primary the primary concept is the sense of I, I being, I am, I am. And is this I the, the ego? Not necessarily. I is a shapeshifter. It has a potential to be I as ego because God says I am. But the devil also say I am also. He can say I am also. He ego says I am. No, no. They are words, but they, the word I has different meaning, connotation, depending on who speaks it. Mm-hmm. When, when Jesus says I, I am, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I remember a story that uh, he was speaking with uh, some of the, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees and Sadducees or whatever, whatever they were called from, from the Sanhedrin of the time and he they were arguing with him and he said to tell you the truth if you knew the truth the truth would set you free and they were very upset by him saying that he says you know Who are you to speak to us like that? We are children of Abraham. Mm -hmm. As though it was enough to be a child of Abraham, descendant of Abraham, to be entitled to be truth or something. And he said to them, If you were true children of Abraham, you would accept me and the words I speak, because your father Abraham spoke of me. And they said, What are you saying? You are... You are a young man, maybe 34 years old at the time. Mm -hmm. And our father Abraham lived, you know, centuries ago. What are you saying? You're greater than Abraham or something. And he said, to tell you the truth, before Abraham was born or conceived, I am. So, that which says I am in that context is not referring to the ego, nor even to the body of Christ but the spirit of truth. All beings have the sense, I am, all sentient beings. I am is not something that your parents taught you, but the sense I am is actually our name. I would say it is our name. Mm -hmm. All beings refer as I, Mm -hmm. I am. The I, for me, symbolizes consciousness. Mm -hmm. You see? Mm -hmm. I, consciousness, am. Mm -hmm. Am, is. I am, no? But also, the egoic sense also say I. And even the most um, deep delus- delusory state, mm-hmm. people still says I am something. So, it is the first born, it's the first shaped, mm-hmm. the sense I. But when I is identified with body-mind, limited to body-mind and conditioning, it arises as um, egoic individuality. And it's that that has to be transcended somehow. Yeah. <coughs> I wanted to ask you about consciousness. Um, if there is consciousness, there must be something to be conscious of. Is there not? Not necessarily. That's the, that's the normal way of thinking about it. I mean, the conversation we are having must necessarily take place in consciousness. Mm-hmm. The functioning of the senses and the perception of the senses and their functioning is itself inside the greater consciousness. There's conscious of and there's consciousness. Conscious of is the dualistic functioning of consciousness. That I'm conscious that we're sitting here, you're here, we're wearing uh, you know, this clothes or that clothes, we're sitting in a very bright room. That's conscious of. When consciousness can be aware of consciousness only, then yeah, something very different. So would you say that's pure being? Yes, we are pure being, actually. We are the pure being. But because we have been trained somehow, first of all, to believe that we are just the body, we are the body-mind and our education, our conditioning, mm-hmm. that's what gives rise to the secondary identity, the I-me as a person, I the person am. And the person is an illusory entity, in fact. What we are is the beingness. And how does God fit into all of this? How does all this fit into God? All this fit into God. Not God fit into this. 
<laughs> because God is pure consciousness. God is pure consciousness. God is beyond even consciousness, what I would call the field of pure awareness. Everything fits into God. Everything carries the perfume. Everything here you see, when it's cooked down, the DNA of all things you see and the one who sees it is God. I guess I want to bring it to the, back to the practical now, because I guess we've been talking about theoretical things. No, I'm talking about deeply practical things. Mm-hmm. Everything I'm speaking about is the thing as it is. Okay. We may not see that because for me, practicality is only love in action. Mm-hmm. Truth in action is practical. But we can speak in a direct text context of um, practical things. I don't know what you mean, but let's we let's see. Yeah, I guess I'm. I wanted to ask you how how would you and I, I know you don't actually know a lot about Course in Miracles and the mm-hmm. groups and much mm-hmm. of that philosophy, but I guess I want to bring it back to what is it that can be imparted. Mm-hmm to the course community mm. to help them go deeper? I would say, actually, first of all, I think in the essence, I know very much about the Course in Miracles. Mm. In the details and the practice and so on, then I, that, that is not, not so important. I mean, only in as much as the practitioners, and practitioners of that course, mm-hmm. if there is within them an urge or longing to discover truth Mm -hmm. and not merely to discover truth as a practitioner of the Course in Miracles Mm -hmm. because I would see that as a limitation. Not the Course in Miracles or any religious path or any spiritual path. That's fine. But if we are not just dedicated to the costume of our practice Mm -hmm. but what you are trying to find is the truth and not just the way of living. You see, so then that I would make, I would draw some highlight towards that to say, if people are open, Mm -hmm. because if whatever the Course in Miracles is aiming to impart, and Advaita Vedanta is aiming to impart, general Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, anything is aiming to impart or to to attain, Mm -hmm. they are one. Mm. I would just put it that it's a question more of speed. Hmm. What does that mean? <laughs> speed meaning that something, some parts may be prescribed for you to complete in another lifetime. Mm. I know some like that. Or for a very long time you will practice and then eventually you may get there. So I am just telling you something that is possible today. That would be the difference. Because if you say that truth is infinite, Mm -hmm. timeless, omnipresent, it must be here now. Then a true practitioner or a seeker of truth must want to find that as soon as possible. It's like we are poor, we're living on the street begging for bread, and someone tells you, you know what, you're parents have left you this huge sum of money Mm. and I ask you how long do you want to wait to get it you can have it next year 10 years time when you grow a beard whatever it is when you're married or today so some people will want to say well actually I want it today if it's mine this year I want it today where is it my attitude is more like that Mm. it's not hurry But if I'm hungry and the food is thirsty, what is it? I can drink this now. (laughs) (laughs) No, sensible, wise, pragmatic, practical, use the word. But then it's here. If you say, well, actually... It's here too now, but you can't get it until next week. I want to know why. I want to know why. Therefore, my attitude is like this. 
it's easy for me to guide you if you're open that is mm. to discover that truth right now I can show you but most people will not be able to stay in that because the their tendencies are too strong mm -hmm. there's still um, unfulfilled desires mm -hmm. there's still a loyalty to their thinking and their projections mm -hmm. all these things will weigh you down and then you'll feel like I can't sustain it will be like asking you to sort of pull yourself up with one hand so they could go up there but they couldn't stay mm -hmm. so to speak and yet the truth is effortless the self is effortless mm -hmm. so the trouble is not the truth the trouble is the person what the person is what they conceive themselves to be and where energetically your life is most stable energetically for most people life is stable in the in the in the mode of a person that's what they have come to believe well this is where it's at they will return more to that state where they feel comfortable just being a person and tomorrow we'll be there and what are we going to do on Thursday what are we going to do this and they live in that mode but the truth itself is effortless and you also essentially are effortless because you and truth are same thing so if truth is effortful we must look at where what what where is the disparity where is the what, what's gone wrong Charles reading your biography yesterday and um, um, when when Papaji told you that you know for you to really know truth, you have to disappear. Yeah. You got really angry. Yes, yes. And that really resonated with me. Because yes. I, I'm really scared. Mm. I wasn't scared. It wasn't that I was scared. For myself, what happened was that it wasn't like, oh, I'm angry for you for saying that. It was like something deeper down. It was like an old anger. It was like, it, it was an unexpected anger. I have no reason to be angry at Papaji, mm. but something was angry. It was like my devil was angry. You understand? Something inside just got caught. Some place where I was hiding that was still left, something that was still surviving in the dark, in the blind spot of my own seeing, was just caught, mm -hmm. just by his presence even. And it started to... <laughs> and it became so loud inside, so loud, that I was looking at him and I couldn't actually physically hear what he was saying. You know? <laughs> inside my head. Feeling all this rage and it was coming like, oh, you know, you have insulted me and... You have exposed me in front of all these people who have become your joke, you know, you're not my master, who do you think you are? It's all this rubbish, you know, but it was very strong. And I just wanted to escape mm. to another planet, actually, if there was one guy. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. <laughs> so I left that place very, very, ah. I knew I was waiting for this. I told myself I'm, I was waiting for this because this is what I needed to really leave this place. It was enough. Mm. This place where Papaji lived was called is called luck now, luck now. Mm -hmm. But for me, man, it was bad luck, bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going, I'm going. That's what happened. But it turned out beautifully because I went home. I was very determined to pass out of packing my bags to leave. Mm -hmm. It was a very hot day. And I felt to go for a walk. I went out into the local center of the town sat under a tree, fuming. The energy of rage, anger was still inside me. Mm. And then somebody came and said hello, who was also in Satsang. And then I felt, okay, fine. I go back, pack the clothes and go. And I walked off. And after, you know, maybe 30 meters or so, just this cloud I was walking in just vanished. Mm. And it's like everything vanished. Also my identity vanished. Mm -hmm. I could not find myself. 
I'm just reminded of the story of Mara and, and the Buddha. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mara being the demon that came up during when Buddha was, I think, was the last thing that he mm-hmm. faced before his enlightenment. It just feels to me like it's something similar. I think it goes true for many people like this. It was also in Christ also. He was driven to the wilderness yep. and uh, after the baptism. And all that was left inside that needed to be brought out. This, the devil manifested. Where did the devil come from? Where did the devil come from? In the big wilderness, where he come from? Out of the potential of Christ he come. The devil's not living in the wilderness. Hmm. To then put in front of him the remnants of what could catch his mind. And he had to overcome that. He had to transcend that mm, temptations. You cannot be tempted unless you are temptable. That is the greatness of Christ, actually. The greatness of anyone is that what you are is greater than your mind. Hmm. But you must remember and be one with that. It's only because we forget our true nature while mind has such power. Because the mind cannot exist without you, but you can exist without the mind. Mm. The psychological neurotic mind I'm talking about. The functioning mind is fine. It doesn't leave a bad smell. But the neurotic um, psychological devious mind, you have to transcend. Mm. That's what keeps us in the state of duality, negative duality, Mm -hmm. limitation, fear, all these things. And that we as consciousness trust our mind. Or maybe you even don't trust it even, but you have a relationship with it. And because you still give value to it Mm -hmm. in that way, rather than giving value to yourself. I guess I, I struggle with that because I guess some part of me still feels that the mind has a use. It, to me, the concept of spirit being the master and the mind being the servant is important. But here it feels like what we're saying is the mind has to be completely let go of. The mind itself is the self. Mind also emerge out of the, the pure. Mm-hmm. But when the pure imagines itself to be the mind and the body, mind becomes a deceiver. It role becomes that. It role comes to test you because you have descended, actually, into a grosser realm. From, from the state of pure consciousness, we believe ourselves to be the body-mind and conditioning, which itself is the It is the fall. Mm. You understand? Mm. Because the mind, this neurotic mind, cannot intimidate the pure self. Mm. It can only intimidate the idea we have of who we are. So it's that aspect of the mind that must be transcended. Surprisingly, when it is transcended, meaning its influence is transcended, it changes sides and becomes your servant. Mm. But not before. The mind is not your friend, not yet. As long as we have the sense that I'm this person, this is me, this is my life, I'm going here, I'm going there, I do what I want, the mind will ride your back. The mind is not here to be a servant of the ego. And when you don't know yourself, we are functioning as the ego. The mind is here to frustrate the ego. That is the glorious role of the mind. The mind is here to frustrate the ego. Yes. I'm talking about in a spiritual sense now. I'm not talking about mind as the ability to create all these beautiful buildings and to create, you know, that's also mind. It's also mind. It's also the self. Mind is also the self. Mind is consciousness. Mind is God also. Right. But when God changes in a way to become sort of like to play as a person, 
then mind also comes down, also to play, you see, as that which is in conflict with the person. Playing like a friend, and you know, it's like that. Mm-hmm. Like the mind will tell you, you know, this person is walking with a limp, and you're with your friends, you know, make a joke of this guy, make a joke of the guy. And he goes, oh, yeah, you know, hello, limpy, and everybody goes, ha, 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 ha. And then the guy is really hurt, and then the mind itself says, you shouldn't have done that. Mm. You understand? It plays both plays with you. Right. And it is deeply linked to our sense of who we are. It, when you become clean, mind becomes clean. Mm-hmm. But it will not go to the door before you. Bringing it to the level of global consciousness. In what I've seen and what I think is happening on this planet mm-hmm. is that there is huge change. At least, I mean, change is happening all the time, but there is a period that it really feels like the earth on, and humanity is waking up to the nature of themselves as one being. Would you comment on the current times? I don't believe it's true. I'm sorry. I want to believe it's true. Mm-hmm. I don't believe it is true. I believe that more and more with the, with the facilities such as like, you know, the World Wide Web or something like this yep. has a tremendous role to play in the potential for making available and accessible the wisdom of the self. But the internet doesn't work for the internet. It works for the mind of men. So if it is used in a beautiful way, it's used in many different ways, no? Mm-hmm. It's, ma- it's also used for very corrupt ways, but it also has a potential to be used for beautiful ways. Mm-hmm. And now these days, for those whose inclination or their temperament is oriented towards spiritual discovery, internet is also facilitating this wow. also, no? And... Uh, I would say some of what we are sharing today you would not be able to get on the internet. You would not have been able to do, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. You'd have to go to some place like Tibet or India or some place and, you know, traditionally it would take 12 years living in the presence of a master you know, before you have imbibed enough, absorbed enough to wash the mind clean uh, or to realize the self. What now is everything becomes very accessible, Mm -hmm. which is good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the proportion of people has changed, that larger numbers because of this would change. I think there's a lot of people who for, who, for them, spirituality is still a kind of novelty. Mm. It's not yet a portal to truth, to real truth, mm. to conceptual, intellectual grasping or conviction of truth, yes, but to themselves discover that they are the living embodiment of the truth. I don't know how many people like that. It would be great that more and more come into that understanding. And I cannot give numbers, I don't think anybody can give numbers. But it is not enough, I have to say, to simply have have a, a concept of what truth is, to even believe that this is true, to have beautiful feelings that arise out of at least the opening up of the mind and the consciousness. And that, that is also good. But to be the truth, not be as an action taken, but be as a realization, as an understanding that is established so profoundly that it replaces the ego. I think it's rare. So you don't buy into this concept of acceleration? It may well be, and everything I'm doing is to accelerate that. Mm -hmm. And other beings, wonderful masters in the world are doing it. 
they try, but they are compelled to. But I don't want to, because it's not the first time. In my age, more than you, I would have seen it two or three times, where this global fantasy that, oh, this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. The world likes this kind of thing now and again. But it never goes the way that we project. And we will never have an accurate reading of what really is. Nobody, not, not, not even a Nostradamus can tell you these things. And it's better that we don't think we know. Because what we think we know, we completely ruin, in fact. The life is best lived in its natural speed of unfolding. The human mind is all into projecting. It wants to bet on it. Even it put the bookies will start to open up shop about uh, betting about it. But the day when we'll stop betting, <laughs> you understand? The mind cannot help it. I just don't want to. I don't see any need, any greatness, any truth, in trying to create any spiritual fantasy. Okay. Why not find out what can be found out now? This is what, but what I'd want to be saying to people. What can you find out today? Because if it takes you 50 years to discover the truth, and that day will be a Wednesday, it will not be a day unlike this moment. I don't see what difference it would make on that moment that you discover. Of course, you can say, you will be by that time you'll be ready, and that is true. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't not want to force ripen something. Mm -hmm. The truth intact, perfect as it is, is here now. But the person we have become may not be ready to embrace that. So what about destiny? Mm. It's one of God's beautiful concepts. There's no destiny for the pure self. Mm. There's destiny only for the body-mind identity. Mm. Mm. It is also a concept. We can talk about this, but in the end, it will not help you to discover the truth, except that we don't become obsessed about these things. <coughs> more important that someone tries to find out what is really true and really who really am I, that which dwells in this body, to realize the full potential of it, not the partial understanding, but to discover and be that. Mm -hmm. mm. It just feels so confusing sometimes. It's, it's like the, the mind is the both the canvas and the and the instrument. And for me, it's just, I, I, I follow what the cause calls the Holy Spirit. Mm. And I, in a sense, surrender to that higher power. Because I really feel like it's just hard to, to navigate this, this maze, this infinite maze yeah. without... I want to tell you, you don't have to navigate. You have a small role to play. This is the beauty of this understanding. Nobody can figure out this mighty universe. But the one who knows the self knows it spontaneously. The mind is a very unstable realm, most unstable. Therefore, to plan your route through it, the waters will always be changing. There's a higher way, a purer, more direct way. Much, much, much more. I would not tell anybody, go and study your mind, except a little bit. Understand a little bit how it is. If I understood this, what this is, then I can understand what everything else in this universe is. I don't have to understand this thing, and this thing, and this thing, and this thing, this thing, this thing, this thing. I don't understand any of this. 
Nobody can understand it. All that you see, all that you consider to be yourself, is the product and the content of the waking state. In deep sleep you have no cognition, no perception, no identity, no belief, no religion, no I. And we enter this state with pure grace and surrender. Every human being, even an atheist, Buddhist, all go to the same state. And we love to be in this state where nothing is, not even I is there. Hmm. But something is here. Something is there. That we really are there. But it itself is not sleep. And when the waking state arises again, then the I again emerges, and when the I again emerges and becomes the me, then the you emerge, and then time emerges, and then other emerge, and then world emerge, job emerge, relationship emerge, belief emerge, all these things emerge. We are we are also actors inside the waking state and witnesses of it at the same time. If I can get people to come to that place where they transcend the person and become the presence, that will be already a good start. But a lot of resistance is there to move the person into presence. Presence is the sense that I am, the intuitive sense of being, when that is not identified with any other concept or intention. The perfume arising out of that isolation is peace and joy, light, love, fearlessness. It is the godly state, the godly principle, in form, in manifestation. But there is a stage beyond this one, and I don't want to talk about it, until one comes at least to that state, the state I am, the unmixed state of I am, not contaminated with identity and memory and projections, attachments and so on. Because these uh, energies, they stifle the spontaneity of being, when we identify ourselves as merely a person. It is a severe limitation of consciousness. The person is also consciousness, but it is a limited expression of consciousness. On every level of consciousness, even the very limited level of consciousness, there is joy and there is affinity there. This is why the beings can stay there for quite a long time. Because the juice of consciousness is there and the vital force. Sometimes I wonder if it was not there, or if it was only a dew drop of it there. The aspiration would be greater to come out of it. Because even demons enjoy their existence. What about freedom? Is is freedom then an impulse? <coughs> is freedom then a is what? Is freedom then an impulse, uh, almost like a force to for the self? While we are in the dreaming state, freedom, the impulse, the concept of freedom, uh, must come, because it becomes the um, uh, it becomes the driving force that is necessary yeah. in order to to leave. Uh, the state of bondage mm -hmm. to the body. There must be the aspiration for freedom. Ultimately, even this aspiration will fall away. Hmm. Mm. Hmm. Because freedom is natural to us. It's our natural. It's our natural state, hmm. awakened state, when we are free from the mm, hypnosis of conditioning and identity. Mm. But while we have that identity, then the aspiration for freedom must be there. 
Otherwise, a human being is as good as dead without aspiration. For a while, the aspiration for freedom takes on, puts on different garments. It could be an aspiration to succeed in life, to get married and so on. It's all aspiration for freedom, for liberation, when the being cannot see that directly. It will try and portray freedom through a relationship or through, you understand? through healthy living or something like this, because it cannot embrace the pureness of this uh, freedom beyond even the concept of freedom. It is not, we don't realize that that is our self, is that. That yourself is love, yourself is freedom, yourself is joy, yourself is infinite. Mm -hmm. To a human being, they are confused to hear these terms. What, you, what the hell are you talking about? You know, my life is just from day to day. I'm living from hand to mouth. They cannot understand that yet. And yet, that is the the deepest truth. But do you not think then the human being attaches all these things to itself in order to experience that that goal? I say myself that consciousness creates a problem in order to experience transcending it. Yeah. Not the human being. The human being itself okay. is the expression of consciousness. The human being is not the controller mm -hmm. of consciousness. Mm -hmm. We are ourselves the portrait of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Do you think this happens with all beings, like animals and plants and minerals and yeah, everything, 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 everything. Even a bit of snot is the expression of consciousness. So everything is alive? Even the inanimate objects are alive mm. because they are, they are expressions of consciousness. But we don't need to know that, you understand? We don't need to know that. <laughs> If truth is what you're seeking, actually, we don't need to... We are having fun, actually. I'm talking about these things. It is truth also. It is uh, truthful. Yeah. Yes. But there can be a fascination about these things for mm. some people. I say that what I'm speaking now comes naturally mm. Mm, as waves of illumination that come when the mind is being set free from the stranglehold of identity. Then all these things, you come to know about them spontaneously. Mm. I don't see that they are the most important. For me, teaching is not the most important thing. Discovery is the most important thing. Yes, you mentioned that to me, mm. um, that you are not a teacher, but you just seek to facilitate discovery. You can put it like that. I was. Obviously. Okay. <laughs> Tell us about that. I think that uh, our culture as a human being is to learn something. Yes. Yeah. But in spite of learning, what we produce is just mostly mm, concrete things. It has an objective, concrete expression. About ourselves, we know very little. We learn about everything else, but about ourselves, we know very little. When human beings study themselves, they call it, I don't know, psychology, philosophy, or something. But these are just concepts. Real learning or discovering about oneself does not lead to philosophy. It leads to liberation. Liberation is when a human being has really fulfilled their opportunity in this existence. They've come back to their original self, where they're naturally happy, naturally at peace, naturally compassionate, naturally knowing the unity of all things beyond merely intellectual conviction. And is that enlightenment? We can call it enlightenment. Enlightenment would mean only to realize what you've always been. And that you don't become. Therefore, I say you don't need to be creative. Don't use imagination. Mm -hmm. You don't need knowledge. You don't even need study, mm -hmm. if truth is what you're seeking. If knowledge is what you're seeking, 
then you need all these things. You have to study all these things, compare all these things. But it will not necessarily lead you to liberation. It might lead you to super ego, to pride. So you would say enlightenment is a shift rather than a process. I think everything you do with a genuine search for truth take you nearer to to that state. I would call it grace picks you up more than you pick you up. You're carried by the wind of grace. Grace is another name for what we are also. Mm-hmm. Rarely is a human being single-minded enough to attain freedom. We are so invested in duality. It is grace that puts you prepare whatever it requires to transcend the influence of the mind, to drop the identity. I don't even want to say drop the identity is the most important. More to discover what is true mm. rather than to fight off what is untrue. <clears throat> hmm. That's interesting because uh, I guess I've always seen it as a a process of negation. I am not this, I am not this. But what you're saying, is that different from... I am not this is an ancient way. I am not this, I am not, I'm not this, I am not... It's depending again on how genuine is and how urgent your search is. You can say, I am not this finger, I am not the ring. I am not this finger either. I am not the finger there. Then it would be the mind who would be doing that. Because if it does it like this, it's going to take hundreds of years to go through this universe. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? But if it says, well, if I'm not the hand, I'm not this body, the tree is also a body. I cannot be anything with a body. I'm looking at my hand. My hand is not looking at me. I'm looking at this world or this earth. Because the world is a different place. And all things are comprised, composed out of the five elements. I am the witness of the five elements and their combinations. Mm. So they are phenomena for me. They are images inside consciousness. I cannot be that. So in two scoops, you have completed the entire universe then. Rather than saying, I'm not the grass, I'm not the clouds. and This is buying time for the mind. Well, I guess you see a, a certain section of that illusion, don't you? I mean, it's like if something comes up in me, mm. then I'm present with that, and I say I'm not that. Mm. It's not like I mean the way I well, see it. Well, it's not just to say I'm not that; it's to see I'm not that. Not just to say I'm not that; it's to see. But I mean, I am the witness of the arising of something, the sense of its presence and its departure. So obviously, I cannot be that because when it departs, if I was that, I would also be gone. It's very practical, very matter of factual. Anything I see also, it appears inside. And when it appears, in that moment it is seen. I was here before the appearance of this. Now this is here. I am the witness of it. And I am the witness of the, that it's not here anymore. So it cannot be what I am. It cannot be the seer of it. And everything is appearing like this, including belief, personality also, I'm watching the breath. Is the breath watching me? No idea. No, you must know this thing. The, the watching must be coming from here. The center of the watching was coming from here. Of the earth and the world. The earth is one. We are living there's one earth, but there are millions, billions of worlds. The worlds is only what you what is shaped, your picture of the earth and your place in it and your interest and your projections and your dream superimposed upon the innocent earth make it your world. And each being has their own take on the world. 
we can look at these trees and yeah, we all see the same, same trees. Yeah, but we all feel it differently. Because some trees, you may have a very strong feeling for them, so you have a greater relationship with them. That's a uniqueness already. Other things may be there also. We're doing that with everything you see to privatize the manifestation. And each one, it functions differently because we impart the herbs and spices of our own belief and creativity and desire and dreams and attachments onto it. We perfume it with our own projections. And then we are living in the world of our own projections also. Mm. Even the beings as they exist, we project onto them personalities we want them to have what for us to enjoy also. This is what I mean by the world. And that world is also passing. And the earth also is changing. Everything that you perceive, even the senses and their ability to function is also changing. You're able to tell that your eyesight is getting weaker. Something which is this, which itself is not sight. Hmm. It happens in the mind. The mind is only a, an energy field. You are the weakness of that. You are the weakness of mind. You are the weakness of no mind also. Is it, but am I speaking anything so strange? Are you not the weakness? Who can, who can refute? It's just in a space that's so abstract, I can't... How do you conceptualize that? Why do you have to conceptualize at all? Please listen, because we are obsessed with conceptualizing. But at some point, if you and when you understand and are yourself, all the concepts will lose their potency. Now, can I explain what I mean? Sure. If we are deeply attached and have the need that the concepts at all, in, at all costs, the concepts must be preserved, then you will not become free. First, you must come to the place where the concepts themselves take birth. They take birth in you. <coughs> Hmm. I am that vastness, I am that emptiness, I am the weakness of the concepts arising and their meaning, their potential. I make use of them. I can only be conditioned to believe them to be greater than what is or something like this. It's only belief. If you follow through the inquiry, you can come to see right now also. It brings you to that place of emptiness. Now, initially, you may think, whoa, you know, what is this? Uh, everything is collapsed. I've got no world. It's only been your mind is still interpreting. But without, when this interpreting tendency of the mind is also seen, so I say, but also I'm not this. I'm rejecting, not just kind of haphazardly. No, but wisely I'm looking and looking and seeing, but that also is just momentary. All this is momentary. My idea of myself is always changing. Also, this is momentary, it cannot be the real. Then like this, this is the true negating, if you look. It's not just, oh, I'm not this, I'm not this, I'm not... No, no, it's looking and saying, but I cannot be any of this, not even this. Mm. I have nothing against this, I'm grateful for this, because this allows me to experience. But to say, I am that, no. The breath also, I'm grateful for this, because the breath also engineers somehow the functioning of perception. Also this, I know this thing. One day this will be finished. Will I be finished? I, as thought construct and, and egoic identity, that will be finished. And it will raise again to be in another bullet until it really comes to what I'm telling you to do to point you to this. Every being, they know what I'm speaking, someplace inside you. Mm. There may be some fear arising in the functioning self because of conditioning. But with a little, mm, what I would call, uh, contemplation, encouragement, and to be 
in the energy field of satsang a bit, you can then begin to see. You can bear your own silence. Most people, they cannot bear their own silence mm. or your own emptiness. Mm. But you worship the Buddha who is empty and Christ who is empty. You think Christ has all this course in miracles saved up in him? The Bible says there's nothing at all come out of emptiness. Everything is coming out of the vastness of the being. Having discovered that, I have no interest to collect anything at all. It's just clutter. Just the emptiness is there. The emptiness I can call also love. But I don't need to hold on to anything at all. In fact, I find that that gets somehow in the way. It's not even get, even that cannot get in the way of anything. It's just unnecessary. So this is utter simplicity. Yes, but it's not a practicing simplicity. It's just what it is. It's not like there's somebody doing simplicity. Mm. All of this is an expression of a simplicity. As I started by saying, the truth is utterly simple, mm -hmm. but the seeker of truth is complex and complicated. Mm. He only has to transcend himself. No one has to transcend truth. Nobody can transcend truth. You can transcend the influence of the mind, which you must, in order to be effortlessly happy. And not just to be selfishly happy. The one who is free is not selfish at all. Even by doing nothing, they change the orientation of existence. They perfume the atmosphere with, with the energy of joy and liberation, love and life, and light. They have the same God quality. God is not doing anything at all. And yet, ceaselessly, the creation is moving just by the presence of God. So would you say that God didn't create the world? Yes, it didn't create the world. The world is not created. The world is creating. Creation is like a noun. Creating is the verb, the verb of creation, not the noun of creation. Hmm. There's a, the action of creation is is every second moving. You can say the creation, yes, of course, we said the creation, but it's dynamically changing. This tree was not there in the day of Adam and Eve. But his great 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 grandfather grandmother was there. It's just as real as it was then. But it's a movement. Were you there at the the first burst of creation? The Garden of Eden, were you there? Yes, you were there before that even. But not as Ken, <laughs> not as Muji. <laughs> Muji, I wanted to ask you about following a teacher or a guru. And uh, I guess this almost runs counter to my, my, I guess, my conditioning or my, the way I've been seeking is that I've always trusted in the Holy Spirit. Mm and not a physical human being. Mm. And I know you come from a lineage, the Indian, the Indian tradition of following a guru, and that mm. transmission is important. Mm. I was wondering if you could say a few words on that. <laughs> I don't come from that lineage. Okay. I don't come from any lineage I'm at all. To... Actually, no, but I have to correct a bit, no? Because sure. um, um, I had no previous idea about what whether someone should follow someone or not. I mean, I um, uh, I was brought up very much in Christian tradition and very grateful for that. Hmm? And, you know, at my own transition 
from being just a regular guy on the street to to coming more deeply into the understanding was something that really it was a miracle in itself for me. It was a change that was there, and it made Christ a living reality for me. It was also before, but not so, but inside now, inside. No? So I call that presence that was a meeting with God. A kiss from inside my own self happened. So that changed my life in a very profound, radical way for me. I never questioned, whoa, was this my mind? Or something. None of this. It was completely clear for me. That this. But that felt like a, a, a gradual process. Because I, I did read that you spent six years with your, with your sister and there was this... No, it was a, it was a, a grenade in my head. Okay. Okay. <laughs> a very peaceful grenade. I love it. <laughs> At first, like, this happened. But everything was changed from one day to the next day. But it continued to to somehow deepen, you can say, or mature, I don't know. Like this, something was like that. And... Um, I was not used to, and still I'm not reading many books. Now we have a lot of books around, but mostly people read them who come to spend time where we are now. Mm-hmm. But um, in in that time, it arose in me because I only read the Bible then, mm. and uh, it arose in me this feel for knowing something more about what was going on in such a powerful way. Mm-hmm. And uh, I first encountered the book on Ramana Maharshi, yeah. but I couldn't. It wasn't right for me then. I couldn't really embrace it. It was felt very intellectual for me. Mm. I was very much into the surrender and the God knows best, and you know I don't know anything. And that was natural for me. It wasn't a practice. It was just what I felt. That is, th- that's all I can do. I discovered uh, the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, it's an Indian saint. It was no longer in the body when I found about him, but it was so powerful a support for what was happening for me. And um, so I had a chance to go to India in 1993. I had no, you know, lonely planet guide or nothing like this. I just went to India, I went to Delhi, and I thought maybe I'll go to Calcutta, where Ramakrishna lived, mm-hmm. because. The book of uh, the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna was written in such a vividly beautiful way. I think I like to go and sit in his room, maybe you know, look at his slippers or something. I don't know. I feel so, <laughs> so strongly that he had really, so much of what he said freed my mind from the little, the little tight places it was going sometimes. But I never went there. And I went to India after I went to a place called Rishikesh in the north of India, the foothills of the Himalayas. Mm-hmm. And there I met some devotees of Sri Punjaji, who I knew nothing about. I knew nothing about gurus, not particularly, you know. So I didn't go to India looking for any guru. I went there to look for, you know, just uh, Ramakrishna's place. And then by chance I encountered Papaji like this. And I can see that uh, grace, destiny brought me there. You see? And um, when I first met him, I felt that I was in the presence of a very powerful being. But I didn't really have, uh, you know, a lot of things going on in my head about that. Mm -hmm. I had by then um, been sort of five or six years into my own, you know, sort of like cooking. (laughs) And uh, when I met Papaji, then suddenly I was being made aware of like a great, the great space of being. That was not something I was used to. It's uh, about the I quality, the importance of what that is. And so the sense of this expansiveness would begin, begin coming to my consciousness. Whereas before it was God and God and me living inside his heart. It was more this, this, this space of being. And um, it, was, it was right because... This God took me to this God, mm-hmm. to this God space. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
you know, it was not a love story from the beginning, you know. Uh, just I sat in many satsangs and listened and so on. Yeah. It was only after I met him in that encounter when I wrote to him and went up in front of him that, uh, you know, I felt the might, the power of his being actually shook, shook me, stirred me up very, very strongly. And then somehow after this, I felt a tremendous... First, uh, my old self, sense of self vanished. I couldn't find like a context of me, like maybe how you might wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and you have no idea of where you are or who you are or something. That happened like, no, looking at my hands, but this is not me. Hmm. I, this is not what I am. I knew it so powerfully. And then shortly, within a few moments, a, a great love for Papaji arose. Then I realized I did not have love for him before. I had respect, but not love. Hmm. Like this. So, was there ever a fear that you would lose this? No, it didn't really enter my mind like that. The first encounter that happened in 1987, that one, uh, when the first night I made a prayer with this, you know, man. Mm -hmm. And I felt so light not like ever before. I didn't want to go to sleep because I felt I might wake up and it's gone. But I woke up and it was still there. And it never left. That peace never left. That lightness never left. When I met Papaji, something more was still there. And uh, something, I don't know, fell, fell, fell out. Sometimes I say, I fell through a hole in the universe. Hmm. I, I don't know what happened there. So, twice leaving Papaji's presence, I left without, in the most unexpected way. And... Um, I came back to London, went back to London, and just carried on in my way. I was selling incense in the market and stuff like this. <laughs> yeah, I've been to Brixton Market. Yeah. It's great. And gradually, somehow, I just started to meet people, and they, we talked, and somehow it seemed really good. Just something like that. Hmm. Yeah. So if your question is, you know, about this, um, the need for a teacher and so on, I feel it's a very genuine thing, it's very good. Because a true liberated being knows everything about how your mind is working. Sees how you where you're blocked. Even you may think I'm not blocked, I am fine. I you know they tell you, come on, you're lying. Why well, you don't have to lie about this? I can see, you know, there's something here. You can uh, if you want to, I can help you to go through this or something. They can help you like that. They don't have to teach you, they can find the thing you need to know what is blocking you a little bit or something, yeah. and help you to... But you also, it's good for you to come forward and say, I feel somehow that I'm not able to stay in the space. Sometimes I can go there, but I can't stay there. Is it possible not to stay there? And they will tell you, no, it's not possible to stay there. <laughs> it's not possible to stay there. If you went there, it's not possible to stay there. But if you are that... Sorry, when, where? If you go there, meaning that people say, you know, I sometimes I meditate, I come back to the place where I'm just, I'm just in harmony with God or I'm just in the space of the beingness or something like this. Mm -hmm. Understand? Mm -hmm. I know that there's nothing exists apart from this or whatever we say when we are, when we are in that state or whatever. People mm -hmm. say, I go into this space and I like to know how I can keep it, how I can, you right. know, okay. how can I stay there? Yeah. And he will tell you, you cannot stay. <laughs> you cannot stay. <laughs> you are not really you yet. The real you is that. <laughs> <laughs> you see? The one who is coming to stay there is your attention, which you're calling you. Come there and back. You're living as your attention. <laughs> you have to dis discover the real you has no effort at all. It is complete. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a practice, so it's not an achiever. It is that. 
you need master for this. Because your mind, if you use your mind, your mind will not do anything that will threaten it, its, its existence or its survival. Hmm. You see, the mind will, itself will tell you, you don't need a teacher, don't need a teacher. I can do it by myself. <laughs> because it knows the teacher alone can help you to do that, to go beyond the rule of the egoic mind and kingdom, like that. I'm afraid of asking you what my block is. Well, I don't want to go around telling people where their block is. <laughs> Enlightenment consultancy. Um, first, someone has to genuinely come with the with the urge to move beyond. You know the the grip of the conditioned mind. There must be something there. Not help me to go to the next step. But you, the next step will be your last step. No. Okay, I can't help you. You're into steps. Want to make one step or no step that will take you completely to two. Let's not be small about it. Only fear makes us feel, ah, I'm not sure if I'm ready, I'm ready, if I'm ready for that. Well, you're not ready to be you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ready, you're not ready to be you? <laughs> I want to continue being the idea I have of me. I have to continue being my self-portrait. A self-portrait is not you. Even if you're Leonardo da Vinci, your self-portrait is not you. So, this is the correct way someone come, they say, I really, I don't know, I don't know anything at all, or I, I, I feel like I studied this thing, but I feel like it, I really feel like this something is really missing. Some people come up and studying for 35 years, Buddhism or whatever thing, and I just haven't had that experience. I say, it's just experience you want? You don't want to be just free. Why are you looking for experience? Experience is all going to come and go as well. Why are you searching for what's coming and going? Everything is coming. You don't have to be spiritual to watch what's coming and going. Everything is coming and going. When you find something that's not coming and going, and when you know this thing, when you know this thing, then you can be fine with what's coming and going. I'm trying to pull you out of this world. This world is this, world is this too. But the understanding about this world, based on a human conception, is very weak. It's not too true. And what happens is that we can be, to some extent, devoted to the illusion of freedom and not be free. Mm. You see. Or if you don't care about freedom at all, you don't have to care about freedom. I feel this is freedom. Free, this is freedom. But freedom is the freedom to be free and the freedom to be bound. It's consciousness's game. It's God's game, if you want to put it like this. Someone said to me in satsang, I just feel like God is, is playing with me. I said, no, I don't think God is playing with you. I think God is playing as you. Hmm. So no, that makes it feel different, someone. <laughs> but uh, who are you playing as? Who are you? Hmm.
You see, I, the first thing I wouldn't want to say to somebody, I can see what your block is. First thing I tell you that you are the truth itself. That's what I see. But what I hear is uh, not a conviction of that. I hear I have this thing to do and I'd like to do this and I'm practicing. I say, but that's not, that's not true. <laughs> mm. Or it might be true that you feel that way, but it's not truth. I wanted to ask you as well, but the, I guess the variety of approaches to this that you're pointing to, mm. would you, is it one approach manifested in different forms? I could say like that. I don't, I, I don't find anything disagreeable with that. The approach would be the search for truth. That's the approach. That approach leads to um, spiritual discipline or religion or whatever else you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it starts out in this fundamental way that it is a search for truth. Or you can say the search to be home or the search for unity. It's all the same thing. Mm -hmm. I see no difference. Search for freedom. Yeah. So, I guess I asked this the question about following a guru mm -hmm. comes with this my thinking that there can be a bad guru and a good guru. Mm -hmm. And I guess there are no experiences that are. They can lead us away from this. You get the guru that you deserve. Right. For the moment. No, that's not a vindictive statement. It's totally appropriate because you may think, oh, I did, I'm ready to meet uh, the master guru, the Sadhguru itself. Mm. But maybe first you need to meet a guru who is going to expose your that you are still treasuring certain things, which make you not yet ready to meet. Mm. You're not able to assimilate the presence or the guidance of a true one yet. Still something is buried. So you may meet someone or something, you get a bit caught up there for a while. Just like many people feel like they come into the world and they should have the greatest relationship with the, with the first love and be happy ever after. No, you're going to meet someone who is at the same resonance a little bit with your own tendency. You have to grow. You have to evolve in a way. Yeah. You cannot just, because you exist, you're entitled to have the best relationship in the world. No, perhaps you can have a few terrible ones first and it helps you to get out of your own crap. Maybe you have a lot of nonsense inside and, you know, I mean, it would be terrible if a really good person came along and found someone like you. You think, oh, I must find someone so beautiful. But maybe somebody doesn't deserve you yet. So you have to hang out with someone who has got something and something. We cannot know exactly what it is. They have a little, little bit. Uh, and then gradually you grow and grow and grow and you leave more delusions apart, more illusions apart. You leave them. You spend a bit more time to find value in being with yourself more and stuff. And then eventually you may meet someone with whom you, you have a relationship that's beautiful. The best relationship is going to come when you are discovering the truth. Because you go beyond your little self and your little meanness because there's a saying the opposite of love is hate. Mm -hmm. But I've found the opposite of love is more selfishness. Hmm. I think we are very selfish. You understand? Where is it just hate? Many people don't just hate hate. But everybody is selfish. Meaning that you care more about yourself than anything else and so on. And although even when you say, oh, I, lo I love the world, it's only because you want to show people that you love the world or something like that. You want to make something about you again. You know, it's about you. So if you are selfish, 
how are you going to have a beautiful relationship with anyone? Mm. You see, things like this. So in the same way, spiritually, and relationships is inside a spiritual kingdom, no? you're, you're discovering. Any genuine discovery is a spiritual discovery. And if you... What does spirit mean to you in the first place? Spirit. Yes. Spirit is also not a name for, for what is or being. No? The truth. I can say, I am spirit. That's all. The self, spirit. Not the form. You can speak about spiritual spirit, spiritual personality or something, mm -hmm. but the pure spirit is a bit beyond personality. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just another word I can use. We have to have a lot of words we can use. You cannot stick with one word, you know. Otherwise, you become a fascist. You know, you have to try different words: spirit, you know, being, business. I think that's one self. of your remarkable skills, actually, because I yeah. see you, I see you really as a poet. Really? I see you as an artist. Oh, God. You don't mis mis misunderstand my teaching, no, my way. <laughs> I don't, I'm not interested in poetry. I'm interested that somebody get the truth. I understand that. But what I'm saying is that you... Okay, let me explain my thinking a little bit. Yeah. I, I feel like every... There are wisdom teachers mm -hmm. who teach the same truth, but the personality is used to bring forth this expression. Yes. And with you, I really feel like you are an artist and you use that words, those words to, it's a, it's a dimension, a, a feeling which I've never seen before with uh, any other teacher. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I said like this because, um, because in a way, everything in the life, in every in every culture, in every way of expressing, the truth is there, and we see examples in in different things. So sometimes it comes true like that. So you say like this, you know, um, and it it's able to touch into another place inside of people that just is capable of moving in a broader way, mm -hmm. rather than always like this, less like this. And this is also okay sometimes, but not all the time like this, you know. Yeah. Sometimes, no, that's right out. So <laughs> sometimes we say, no, no, stay careful. Stay with this. No, 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 don't go. No, no, stay with this. Next thing I say, try it out. Forget about it to someone else, no? Mm -hmm. Because for that one, that's right for them to do. Another one is always drifting about the place. I said, no, you stay with this, okay? Until I come back, stay with this or something. So it has to be versatile. The expression is versatile. But the truth is one, isn't it? Well, you were asking me something else about, uh, I don't remember, uh, I don't remember. Gurus, <laughs> and, uh, gurus, uh. anyway, don't yeah, well, to... well, it was about, hmm. I guess, how do you, I was going to ask, how do you choose a guru? But then you uh, answer yes, that, yes, we yes, say, yes, yes. we get the guru that we deserve. And I also wanted to say, I was, the other question, which was, no, let, let's, okay. let's, let's take it out of a less personal way that the guru okay. you deserve, because that's one way of using it. Let's say you get a teacher, whatever the teacher is, like this, who is more compatible with who you are, with 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 your present level of resonance. You know, okay. If you are in a certain state, then you know you tend to be at this. Then you find someone who can help you, who's through whom you can somehow go to a higher stage of consciousness, either by frustrating your way or something, or you know, because the ways are different. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a teacher may, you know, keep on smashing you, smashing you. Oh my God, this person is so, you know, so tough. But to another one, he's stroking you. Very good, very good. You know? But to you, oh, you, oh no, no, sit over there, sit over there, like this. Mm -hmm. And you may say, oh my God, you know, what have I done? You're always picking on me, picking on you. How dare you think I'm picking on you? Why do you think you are so important to be picked on? Get out. And but that may be good for you in that moment to break something. And they are not doing it because they is something personal. It's like it's the consciousness doing it. Mm. You see, mm -hmm. this is a difference. And something inside must know 
at some level that it's painful, but somehow it's doing something good to me. You understand? The other people say, oh, no, 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 I can't take this. It's too tough for teaching. I have to leave. Hmm. Even in Jesus' day also, something he said, to, one time he said to some people, no? you know, you must, you know, eat my flesh and drink my blood or something. Have you read this thing in the Bible? Yeah, you must you must also eat my flesh, drink my drink my blood, you know. It's all metaphorical, of course, you know, mm -hmm. right? But they many of them turn away, so this is a hard teaching, we can't follow this. Because they, they couldn't follow, and it was he's not afraid to lose some there. Anyway, they were not with him in the first place. If you walk away after that. So this is what I mean that you will meet encounter. It needn't be even a guru like he is my guru. It could be just that association, just like some relationships just come, you know, a little bit bang, 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 and then you're off because you can't, it's not, you're not meant to go further. Another relationship can be all the rest of your physical existence you're together. Maybe into another existence you're together. Mm -hmm. You see? But some only for a weekend, full, you're gone. But you can, it may be very important for you. Some encounters be like this. Even with a master, can be just short. But and some, then you know that you are you are eternally with them, somehow. It's a mystical thing. The energy of a course of miracles is very much linked with Jesus mm. and Christ and yeah. the, the, the Judeo-Christian mm. terminology. Do you want to make a? What do you see? What do you view as that? Do you? Do you? It's fine. I mean, if I came, of course, in miracles, I didn't know anything about this, and this is all about sort of like Muhammad. So, yeah, what does it say? Yeah, it's fine. Mm. It's the, the content. This is about the, the Buddha, you know, Siddhartha, the Bhutan. What we say? You have to do this. And it's very Buddhist language. Yeah, it's good. It's good. <laughs> have this one. Oh, this is about Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know him. It's good. It's very good. But, but let me hear what you're saying. Mm. Because he has many different ways of speaking. Mm. He can also be very straight in, throw everything away. You know that Jesus can speak like that? Depend how good, if you are a really good disciple, if you are a perfect candidate for freedom, he might just kick you over the hill. So I want to go back to this concept with the guru. Mm. I guess here, we formalize it in this figure of a person that teaches you or guides you through the spiritual hmm. journey. But then it's not your lover a guru. It's not your boss the guru. It's not your friend who you have a quarrel with a guru as well. Yeah, if you want to make guru into something like that, your friend, everything you can say, like that a chair, he says, everything. I see the wind, how it comes, it removes all the leaves from the tree to make it just empty. I bow to the wind as my guru. May the spirit remove all the leaves of my ego, like the wind. I see water. I salute water. Because it flows into any shape, assumes any shape. In this, it assumes the shape of a glass. In this, it assumes the shape of the hand. Yet it has no shape, like the spirit. I bow to water as my guru. Isn't it? That is. I see light. <gasps> Without light, nothing is seen. It is the greatest painter. Look, it paints all these things with light. I bow to light. But may the light of consciousness expose all that is not true. Mm. You see? Like this, if it's like this. If you see through your friends, approach, as your own understanding deepens, you'll start to see that maybe everything is my guru. You see? Somebody rob you in the street and beat you up. You're in hospital for five days. But you know what? We have a saying, they kick the shit out of you. Maybe they kick the shit out of you. The shit out of your head also, no? <laughs> now, that's a very quick guru shit, you know? Something something may have taken you six years to process, but in six minutes, it's gone. All of this nonsense is kicked out. Now, you may not bow to your mugger and say, oh, 
how can you have my guru? Somebody may say, thank you for this because I've been trying to work something out and this, this being beaten up just allowed me to drop everything. I'm free of anything. I used to think that life is safety and I see that life doesn't have to be safety. What is safety? I'm just clinging to my body. My body could have just been gone. But I've seen now I do not cling to anything. Thank you to this incident. Thank you for this attack. Or you may say thank you to consciousness for bringing this about. What a guru that we're talking about now is the one who somehow guru, guru is not a person. Mm -hmm. Understand? Mm -hmm. You may see a person's body, what you may call, mm -hmm. but guru is not that. Guru is one who has gone beyond just physical identity, you know, egoic identity functions as the self. Mm. You see? Mm. How would you know God if you not know meet the body of Jesus Christ? You see, some How people would you like know God them. if you didn't meet the body of Jesus Christ? Yes, for, for, for a Christian, for instance. If they didn't have the physicality somehow mm -hmm. of Christ, mm -hmm. the physicality of Christ's words, how would they know God? They say, Intr introduce you to God. When people say, could you show me the Father? He says, you are looking at the Father. I and the Father are one. What do you mean? So they need that symbol. <laughs> yes. You need something. In each one, the Satguru, what we call the pure Guru, which is the pure Self, is there. But the portrait of the Self being expressed as a person does not know the language of the inner one. You understand? You say, I did this, I do that. But when you say, I, who are you speaking about? Because the you pure self? Clearly. No, it's still the consciousness, but it's a consciousness that's adopted certain conditioning and believe itself to be this kind of person, which, mm -hmm. is, which is made up. It's not real. The person is always changing. It's not true. Mm -hmm. You see? So his consciousness is playing through the costume of a person. And that costume person has to somehow listen to the inner voice of their own self, which you call the voice of the Satguru. If you're not able to do that, you have to meet a physical guru, which is manifested from here, to speak to you in a language that you can understand. Hmm. You brought all this into being in order to understand from it who you are. A guru is very different from the, your friend or you know, some other person because they don't have that, they're not, um, their mind is not contaminated. It's not in service to a person. So they're not of the duality and the confusion of a person. Mm. And so also they have the power of the self, the grace of the self, you see? Like Jesus Christ, he say, I have the power to forgive sins. Because people say, but who? Who else but God can forgive sins? But he knew his identity with God. He said, I have the power to forgive sins. Mm. Isn't it? So the one who realized the truth, you know, who have no duality inside them, in a, oh, you have a duality inside you because you're still functioning in this world. I still see you and this kind of stuff. But inside this interaction with you and her and this and that, this is a smaller space of consciousness sitting inside a greater space of understanding. Mm in which it's all love. Love is conversing with love in the form of these bodies or something like that. Or truth is conversing with truth in the form of these bodies. It's like that. Mm. Yeah. Consciousness is speaking to consciousness about consciousness. <laughs> For the love of consciousness. It's like that. When you're a person, I'm speaking with you about her what we're going to do later on and so on. This is a much more shallower conversation. Mm. But when consciousness is somehow self-focused, then all the interactions lead to a state of inner expansiveness of space and mm -hmm. light mm -hmm. and joy and love. In the end, actually, you are, you are empty. You can say you're full. Yeah, you can say you're full. 
Or you can say you're, you're empty, meaning that you're not... The mind will say, well, look, you have no ground to stand on at the moment. You're lost. But that's also a concept. Empty, many times when you feel empty, the mind feels confused and says, ah, oh, look, you know, you're lost, you're, you're nothing, you're done. And you take that to mean something. And you oh my God, you know, I feel a bit lost, feel confused, I don't know where I am, I don't know who I am. That's a holy state. Hmm. Because you listen to the mind, the mind tells you, oh, look, you don't even know where you're going. Hmm? You know nothing about tomorrow, you don't even, look, where's your memory? Ah, oh my God, I've got no memory. Oh, that's terrible. You're in a divine state, but you're just not familiar that you are or your own divinity. Because you are living life like a strategy. You're thinking your life rather than sort of like unfolding. So in a way, a spirituality is a way of re mm, a reacquired taste for who you are. You understand? Because we've developed a taste for who we're not. Now you have to redevelop the taste for who you are. And so you, mm. doing what you do, mm. as you, mm. with all your work and all of this, mm. tell us about that motivation. Is there an impulse there? What is that? Some impulse is there. But I don't feel I'm doing anything at all, actually. Mm. You understand? Nothing special. Mm. Yeah, especially in that I like it. That's what makes it special. I feel completely comfortable with conversing with beings and watching them being free. Mm. Where they believed they were not free. Where they were living in the illusion of unfreeness. And just untangling a few little things inside and say, look, go, go. Mm. Walking with sticks that they don't need. I said, take, take your sticks away. Go, walk, run. Uh, Ah, I can run. You never need the sticks. I'm not giving them back. I throw them in the fire. No, it's true. Mm. But I wouldn't say that that is... I mean, when you're doing what you love, you don't call it work. Yeah. I don't feel like I'm, I'm working. Yes, yeah, sometimes I get tired also. It's mm. true. And sometimes I feel also that uh, I would like to... Even coming here, I felt I would like to stay where I was. Because at the moment we're making a pond and I'm enjoying. And I said, oh, I have to go to Basel. Oh, okay. Right. No? But in the bigger picture, of course I'm happy to be here, no? Mm. But go to here, poor, eating crisps and stuff like this. I'm going on the <laughs> Coming here, sleeping in a new bed, and oh uh, my God, and all this stuff. Met me. It's true. This is good. This is good. <laughs> No, no, I don't complain about all that. Just something, you know, sometimes I like to play a little miserableness. Of course. Just a bit fun. Yeah? Yeah, it's like this. But of course, I'm here, then we are, always when I come, at the end, we say, that's the most amazing thing to have come here and share again with this beauty, this beautiful thing. Mojie, it's been a wonderful conversation. I think we're just going to wrap this one up. Oh, okay. Any kind of last words you'd like to say for this interview? I would say that there is such an incredible magnificence at the heart of who we are. And it's not deep, 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 or high, 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 or far, far, far beyond. It's right here. In the same way that you can sometimes say, I put my, my finger and I can hide the sun. With my fingernail, I hide the sun. A wrong concept, an ill-conceived concept, can hide the intuitive recognition of the holiness that is here. Hmm. And I would like to share that message that it is available. You see. Of course, you may come to a satsang for you, well, nothing really happened. But at least some seeds are planted that will sprout soon into something. You see? Because whatever brings anybody to satsang, they don't bring them just to me. No, they bring them to truth. They put them in front of the fireplace of truth. And something must happen. 
because I do nothing because I particularly want to travel and to speak about these things. I love it, but somehow, if you come, that which makes these things happen, bring this body and that body together, it never fails. So I leave it to do its business. That's beautiful. You see? I just want that, as I said at the beginning, if you are hungry on the street, you have no food, and somebody came and say, you, you, your name is Camp? Yeah, 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 yeah. You are the guy. I'm looking for you. Listen, man. You're a millionaire. You had an uncle who, who passed away and left you this thing. Six months we're looking for you. <laughs> You're a millionaire. And you say, yeah? Oh, can I have this, my millions? No, you have to wait for six years. No, if you're a million, I want my money now. I said, how long do you want to wait for this money? Hmm. And I'm saying the truth is like this. We are millionaires of truth inside. Hmm. If I say it's going to be another six years, you have to do all these things, you have to see all these lawyers, you're going to have to go and give up all this stuff, you have to get rid of one leg, you have to do all these things, and then after the end of that, then we give you the first 5%. <laughs> I said, no, you know, but, I mean, that's not a gift to me. <laughs> My attitude is a bit like that. And at the same time, I feel if people are in a practice that's been going on for years, well, bless you, continue doing your practice. If something makes your heart happy doing that, I am supporting you. Mm. But there are some who are tired of experience, they're tired of practice, they're tired of waiting, they're tired of trying one more experience. I said, no, no, but uh, for me, maybe it's we sit, have a cup of tea, talk about it. Mm -hmm. That's that what I would want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.